Chris Lee, Blake Lovell, and Blaine Gilmer of Southeastern 14 here to talk about the Tennessee Volunteers for the 2023 football season. Lots of excitement in the air in Knoxville after a, just a fascinating season a year ago. The Vols were about that close to the playoff. Uh, didn't go so well at the end. The South Carolina game kind of blew it, but otherwise a, a phenomenal season, Blake. Uh, Tennessee was a team that we liked preseason. And I think the Vols delivered and then some a year ago. Yeah, they did for sure. But, you know, what happens when you you do that? So all of a sudden, you know, there were years where we were talking about Tennessee being kind of the team that had fallen off in the East. And everybody was kind of wondering when they were finally going to make that jump back up. But now everybody knows they can do it. And uh, they know they've got some players coming back that were, you know, a big part of that. Yes, they lost some guys, which we'll discuss. But, um, you know, now you become – kind of the, the old Tennessee again, the team that people just expect to win, you know, double digit games and, um, you know, be the team that has the best shot at challenging Georgia at the top of the East. So um, yeah, it's definitely sort of a mindset shift. And I think we kind of saw that last year though, as they started to gain more confidence and the way they started. And so, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think just to see how they, you know, go into now this season, having to replace some key guys, but also having some guys coming back, like I said, that uh, were key contributors on that team last season. Yeah, for sure. You go from the, the you know, hunter to the hunted type deal. You got that target on your back a little bit. Uh, ask Arkansas a couple years ago. They went through this, you know, Sam Pittman and company, big spike up, uh, got to the, got to that uh, nine win mark. And then a little bit of a down tick last year after they lost uh, some key guys. So now we'll see if Tennessee, do they go that direction or do they use it as a as a building block to kind of further themselves towards getting into the the playoff picture and things of that nature. Guys, what's interesting to me about this program is just how much has changed over the last four or five years. And Blaine, I'll get you to pull up the graphic there in a second. But remember five years ago, Tennessee had switched. It was in the middle of the Jeremy Pruitt era. They were going to go defense first, try to, to grab something off the saving tree. That That went badly quickly. In the pandemic year of 2020, he, of course, got fired not long after the season was over. And that graphic to me is fascinating that we've got in front of us. The, just to give you a little explanation here, most of it you can figure out. AP, coaches, polls, you can see there. We've got a computer composite that we've used. We've got some strength to schedule ratings for some computers we like. And just look at how this team, guys, has changed with Pruitt building on defense, 21 and a half points a game just two seasons ago. Uh, and in last year, more than double that, the scoring margin. Tennessee more than doubled up on opponents. I guess the only thing there not to like maybe is the penalty yards. Tennessee's gotten maybe a little bit more discipline, but maybe that happens with, with more snaps. But, um, Blake, I'll start with you. Just – you don't see many teams change identities in the blink of the eye the way that Tennessee has done and have it go this well. Just the numbers here. And look at the margin of victory, minus 8.6 two years ago to plus 23.3 last year. And, again, strength of schedule is, is pretty tough, pretty comparable between those two years. I don't know if there's another team in the country that is engineered to turn around the way Tennessee has and in terms of just results over the last couple of seasons. Well, I mean, yeah, and I think you just you add to that, there's, there's not a lot of teams in the country that necessarily play the way Tennessee does and and sort of the way Josh Heupel has molded it the, the way he's wanted in only two seasons now. And so I think that's a big part of it is just the the, the way they play. And you know, we, we, we talk about it all during the season, just the, the number of plays, the speed and – you know, fast at everything. That's what it's all about. And so, um, yeah, I think just the, the style is a big reason for that. But again, that, that goes back to Josh Heupel and sort of crafting it the way that he's needed it to be to get them this quickly back to being a team that, like I said, is expected to win double digit games. Now it's no longer just, Hey, can we get to eight or nine wins and feel like we're moving in the right direction when you win 11 games, <laughs> that becomes the new, the new bar, right? Like now it's okay. If we, if we win less than that, is that a disappointment? Because we've already proven we can get here. So like that kind of becomes what they're aiming for now. And yeah, I think the style is a big reason they've done it. So. Yeah. I mean, you see the, the offensive update there, everybody, I think expected Josh Heupel to bring more juice on the offensive side of the ball when he came over. 
you know, from from UCF and what he did and everything like that. But now you're talking about you're talking about astronomical numbers that they were putting up. Uh, in 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 fairness, there were there were different times where the the defense pl- really played a lot better than than you would think seeing some of the numbers because they did hold people, especially people outside of the Georges and things like that, to, as you can see, sometimes well below the the 20 point because their points per game allowed was at 22.8, even with some some high outputs against a, a team like Georgia, a team like Alabama. So they did have good performances defensively last year, but you're you're right, Chris, that the the crux of this has been built on on tempo, on excitement, and on big plays manufactured by the scheme of Josh Heupel on that offensive side of the ball. Well, when you think of alls, you, you think on offense. And we have some interesting numbers defensively that we'll get into in a little bit. And, Blaine, I'll have you pull up our offensive graphic here in a second. But, um, again, a lot of that turnaround has been engineered based on that fast tempo offense Tennessee just runs lightning fast and and I think one thing that's interesting (laughs) Tennessee actually ran the ball a little bit more than it threw it a year ago now some of that's when it had maybe some big leads and was milking the clock but that was an offense that was really balanced a year ago I guess the question this year guys is a quarterback and Joe Milton was a guy that was the punchline of a lot of jokes this time a year ago and I don't know what to make of, of last year, but he sure was really effective when he played. I think he had 10 touchdowns, no picks. And people have said, well, it's Joe Milton. He wasn't any good at Michigan. He wasn't good enough to win the job. But look, Hendon Hooker, when he landed in Knoxville a couple of years ago, nobody was looking at, at that one and saying, hey, Josh Heupel's land a winner. Landed a winner is going to take him to a new level. I'm very interested to see how this offense does under Joe Milton, Blake. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the the arms there, we we certainly had our fun with the the jokes. I mean, what he he threw the ball yesterday. I think it's still in the air. Um, but it's just, <laughs> you know, I mean, I I think that's it. It's like you said, everything does start. I mean, think about everything we talked about in the first whatever minutes of this, like why they've gotten here, how you know, things have kind of become as quick as they have to get them to this point. Well, I mean it's it's their style but who's running it right it's the quarterback it's the guy that that starts everything and that's where it begins and so yeah it's i think looking at it from from this standpoint i mean sure i think it's easy to to have some questions and and wonder you know what are the changes what are the differences um going from hendon hooker to joe melton and you know sure we can look back at a couple things from last season and, and see some stuff before that but um this is kind of a new situation and um, so I think it is going to be fascinating to see how things play out and see just sort of, you know, how he fits into how this particular team is going to play. Because as we'll talk about, there's some other guys too, uh, in terms of the weapons that he has that, that are not there anymore. And that will allow these other guys to step up like Rue McCory and, and squirrel white and those kind of guys. But at the same time, um, yeah, I mean, any expectation you have for Tennessee is all going to start in terms of what, the Joe Milton not just look like game one, but what does he look like game three and game six? And um, as the schedule gets tougher. So, yeah, I mean, it, it all starts there. There's no doubt. Well, and, and Blaine, before you, before you get into Milton too, the other thing I meant to mention, change in offensive coordinator. Uh, so you've not only got a change in quarterback, but you've got Alex Golish now with the head coach at South Florida. So there's, there's more than one big change for Tennessee's offense coming too. Yeah, and and I you got to give Golish credit. I'm sure with game planning and stuff like that. But we all know that this is Josh, Josh Heupel's offense. Much as in, at Georgia, whoever the defensive coordinator is, we all know Kirby Smart. It's his defense, same as Nick Saban with his defense. Josh Heupel is always going to have his hand, much like Lincoln Riley at USC, all that kind of stuff in this offense. But Alex Golish was definitely a good sounding board and a guy who. Uh, at times could could call the plays and things like that. So, yeah, that's going to be a new dynamic there. But, uh, you know, you got to have confidence in Josh Heupel, what he's able to do. He's a brilliant offensive mind. So I'm sure he'll be able to uh, make that adjustment. Um, and they kept a guy on staff to to come into that role as well. So we'll see we'll see how that all plays out in terms of the logistics of it and, and things of that nature. But on going back to Joe Milton, I want to ask you, you're a numbers guy, Chris, and I don't want you to pull up the game log, so no cheating right here. No, Put your Google machine away, okay? Chris, Joe Milton has played 30 career games between just being in games 
between Michigan and Tennessee. How many of those games would you say he's attempted more than 20 pass attempts in, in, in those games? Oh, four or five? Yeah, six. Six. And six. three of those came in 2020 at Michigan uh, when he started the first part of the year. The thing about it is Joe Milton, there's a difference – between we talked about Blake you talked about the difference of okay now you go from having that expectation on you you know going from a team that's looking to become a a, a top tier team to now you are a top tier team there's a big difference in Joe Milton's career of how he's played when he has been the guy and when he has not been the guy when he's just been coming up coming out off the bench free and easy I, he's yet to prove to me and to anybody, really, because he's not made it through an entire season as a starter. You, we're talking about bold predictions and stuff like that a little bit earlier before we got going here, Blake. My bold prediction is <laughs> I don't think he makes it through the season as the starter because of Nico Imaliva and the millions and millions of NIL dollars that they are paying over there to Nico Imaliva because that is a tough schedule that Tennessee has if – there is signs of trouble. We know how it is with NIL these days. There's certain people that are funneling money into that Spire Sports Group, and they may get in the ear and say, "Hey, don't we have this guy that we're investing all this money in over here?" So that's my bold prediction. I don't think I don't think Joe Milton finishes the year as the starting quarterback for the Tennessee Volunteers. But and if that's the case, like you know, there's going to be some there's going to be some questions about what has happened because they're not going to change a guy if they're if they're winning every game. So. Yeah. NIL, it's the era. I mean, look, it's like whether we want to admit it or not, that's going to play a factor in some of these things. But yeah, it will be interesting that they don't have any shortage of options with those two on the roster. So at least it's, you know, it will be it will be fun to see kind of what happens there at quarterback. He's so. talented. Yeah. And Chris, yeah. that was not just me talking. That was former Tennessee, very beloved in Knoxville, former Tennessee coach Lane Kiffin that that talked about that dynamic of NIL. So there you go. Well, that that's a hot topic a lot of places. The other dynamic that's in play right now, too, is the, the 2020 COVID eligibility hangover. And, and you see this on a lot of rosters, but this is one thing that's really stood out to me with Tennessee. And, and I think it's on defense, too, to a degree, but I don't think it's showing up to the degree that it is on offense. Graduating years from high school of, of some of these guys, Joe Milton, class of 2018, um, you go down further, Brew McCoy, class of 2019, Ramel Keaton, class of 2019. There's two of your receivers right there. Jacob Warren, class of 2018. John Campbell Jr., their left tackle who they imported from Miami, class of 2018. Ollie Lane, left guard starter, class of 2018. Give me just a minute. Um, Dane Davis, reserve offensive tackle on the right side, class of 2019. Jackson Lampley, reserve guard inside, class of 2019. Guys, this is an old, old team. And, and remember, that was the thing with Hooker. Hinton Hooker, his first three or four years, was not a guy that set the world on fire. That was not a name that when he transferred from Virginia Tech to Tennessee, that just the, the ticker on ESPN was ablaze and it was the topic of conversation everywhere. And I think that's something that's an interesting dynamic about Tennessee's roster, starting with Milton. Guys, this is an old team that has played a lot of ball and a lot of that together in some cases. You going to go, Blake? You want to start off with that? Well, I mean, here's my thing, right? And I think specifically, and I don't know if we want to necessarily transition yet, but I'm going to bring it up. But it's like there, there are guys coming back on the defensive side of the ball, right? Like they've got some experience coming back. But it is it is also goes back to just the development. It's not just being old. It's just, you know, we know they have to get better in certain areas, even with older guys that have been there and have played a lot of snaps and have started here or started there, right? Like that's still, I think, you know, we can look at the experience. And, yes, I would say this is probably, I don't know, when we start comparing it to other teams in the SEC, I, I feel like this is probably one of the more experienced rosters just from an age standpoint. But, you know, that's where I think it's going to be interesting because – you do have, what is it? I mean, I think they've got seven starters, I think, coming back on defense. But, like, and I know Blaine can carry it from here, but it's like you think about kind of the the defense last season, and, and that's something that I look at is even for an experienced team, uh, which we know, you know, there are some guys they have to replace on the offensive side, especially when it comes to their playmakers. But 
if you're looking at the defensive side for me, it looks in, like to be an experienced team, but it's also a team that has, has got to get better and be more developed on that side of the ball, even with guys that are older. So, Yeah, the good news for Tennessee on the defensive secondary is that they're all coming back pretty much. The bad news is they're all coming back pretty much because they, they were one of the 127th in the country in pass defense last year allowed an average of two, 290 pass yards per game, uh, I believe, was somewhere around that mark, made uh, Anthony Richardson look like Johnny Unitas so much that the Indianapolis Colts said, that's the guy that we want to draft. That, that's, what, that's what happened there in that game. So uh, I think that you know it's going to be interesting. They are moving to Nico Slaughter over there to corner. That's going to be a much better – prospect for them in terms of I mean he just makes plays he's a guy that that he's physical but he also can play the ball better in the air better than anybody they have they get Warren Burrell back from injury do guys like Christian Charles step up uh the safety position is really what they need to be most worried about uh in their in their style of defense much like Alabama's much like Georgia's you got three safeties on the field one of those a star nickel whatever you want to call him um so it'll be interesting to see how that how that piece of it shakes out. But I think with Danico Slaughter, and then they've also got uh, Gabe Judy Lolly, who transferred in from BYU over at the other corner. I think they're going to be much better at corner. It's the middle of the field and the back end that I think you're concerned about. But up front, guys like Tyler Barron, um, you know, they've got a young player, uh, Tyree West, who they're looking to make a jump from his freshman year to sophomore year. Over there, Aaron Beasley in the middle at linebacker. So, as Blake said, they've got experience. They bring in uh, uh, Keenan uh, Peely from BYU as well. So, they got a pair of BYU transfers in that have, have played a lot of ball. So, yeah, experienced, um, but still got guys who had some growing pains last year. Uh, do they get better uh, from 2022 to 2023 on the back end? If they can get just a little bit better on the back end, we know Tennessee's going to be able to score, and that that'll be able to help them out a lot, Chris. Well, I, I know the the past defense ratings from last year were a, a constant topic of conversation. I brought this up last year. I'll bring it up again this year because I think it's worth mentioning. I, I don't think that they were as bad as people think. When you look per pass play, they gave up six point three yards per uh, attempt. They forced turnovers on two point two percent of snaps, which is not bad. Um, you know, and of course the ball was in the air against them a lot because teams were down. And so you're going to rack up some good raw numbers. No, look, they, they did leak pretty badly against Florida and Alabama and some teams like that. But that was for the most part, the trend uh, across college football, good, good teams that can really throw it, put up numbers against most anybody. But uh, back, back what you guys said, one thing that stands out to me on this defense guys, so many guys have played, I mean, up front, Tyler Barron, comes back as a starter at one end. Omari Thomas in the middle is a guy that you're seeing pop up on some all-SEC lists. Um, they got Omar Norman Lott, a transfer from Arizona State, that'll help them with, with depth in the middle. Uh, Bryson Eason, who started a thing, played a lot of games for them last year, is back. Um, you know, Up front, they got a lot of other guys that, that have played a lot of snaps in a lot of years there. Simmons, Garland, um, Ty West, although he's kind of a younger guy. Not guys that are, are standouts, but you you got to have eight, nine, ten guys who are bodies on the defensive line. Uh, that's something that I think Tennessee checks off. The, the linebacking core, Aaron Beasley is a guy that was productive a year ago. He's getting some all-SEC uh, type run. You talked about the, the BYU, I guess, P-I-L-I. Uh, he's a kid who played a lot at BYU a year ago, was very productive. Uh, Arian Carter, star recruit that they're bringing in, I think from in state, is a kid that'll that'll get some run there probably backup time. You talked about the corners, the Nico Slaughter's back. Burrell would have played a lot for them a year ago, if not for the injury that he suffered early. Uh, you know, at, at safety, they've got um, McCullough back another year after coming in from Ohio State. Uh, Wesley Walker, a kid who transferred in from Georgia Tech from in state from the Nashville area. I just look up and down this lineup, guys. You mentioned Gabe Judy Lolly, uh, Kamal Haddon back again after playing nine games a year ago and putting up pretty good numbers. Tennessee has got a lot of guys who played a lot of ball, uh, some at Tennessee, some at other places, and, and that's another thing I like about this defense, just another year of playing ball. Experience makes you better, and, and Tennessee's got 
I don't know about, I don't know if it's fair to say as much of it as anybody in the league, but when we go through these other teams, uh, I'm not sure we're going to find a lot of teams that have got as much experience on the defensive side as the ball as Tennessee's going to have between the starters and the key backups, Blake. Well, and that's where, you know, that's where you know, last year was unacceptable, right? But this year is where you, you can't have the South Carolina type games, even, even you can't have the South Carolina type quarters, right? That they had in that game where Spencer Rattler went, what, I think 30 or 37, six touchdowns, those kind of things. Like, and I know that's kind of an extreme example, but if we really think about it, I guess here's the question. Do we think the offense is going to be as good? I'm not saying I'm leaning one way or the other, but do, do we think the offense is going to be as good this year as it was last year? Because, right, because then you start asking about on the defensive side because you think about the offense really helped them not have as much pressure on them last season because they were able just to put up points in a hurry and they'd run out and just beat people. Um, you know, they'd be up double digits before you knew it. And, yeah, so some of that, like you said, Chris, I think the stats could be a little deceiving in terms of people thinking maybe Tennessee's defense was worse than it actually was when you looked at the overall body of work. But I think now I go into it wondering – Yes, they're, they have that extra added experience, which I would assume has to help. I think it's going to help. They'll get better in some of these areas just because guys are older and all that. But you're still looking for more of that consistency overall. I think you have to ask yourself, what are the expectations? What are the the actual goals? Well, for Tennessee, we've talked about it. They won 11 games last year. They came in second uh, in the East. So the goal naturally would be to try to surpass Georgia – uh, beat Georgia at home, win their other games, and go to the SEC championship game to put themselves in a position to make the playoff. Now, in order to do that, most teams that win the SEC year in and year out and make the college football playoff, they have a position group or multiple position groups that you can point to and you can say that is the best group of name your position, receivers, uh you know, offensive line, defensive line, whatever that is in the SEC, that's why they're going to win this year. Tennessee has a lot, to your point, Chris, a lot of really good ones across the board in terms of experience and things like that potential. I don't think you can point to any one position group and say that is the best position group uh, compared comparatively to any other team in the SEC. I think they are just the overall production level and the overall experience has has risen and Josh Heupel has done a good job of of building that roster don't know that any one position group is elite I still think they're going to be right there in the two to three range in the SEC East uh this year with with how they're how they're built but you see this schedule it's not like it's a easy schedule especially with like Texas A&M, even though that's a home game coming in there, heck, one of their one of their uh, non-conference games, UTSA, I think is going to be a tougher game than, than people uh, people realize with that kind of experience coming in. You talk about experienced team, they're an experienced team, so um, it's it's going to be it's going to be tough, especially to follow up, you know that that breakout year last year. So I'm interested to in what you uh, you think of that there, Chris. Well, I'll give you a couple things. I look at their receiving core, and I don't know that I see a a surefire star there. Uh, but they got a lot of good players, man, and and they've done this the last couple of years. It's been a different guy steps up and becomes a dude. And when you got so many guys to cover and you play so fast, it works to everybody's advantage. They got Brew McCoy, they got Ramel Keaton, they got Squirrel White, they got Dante Thornton transferring in from Oregon. Uh, they got a good tight end in Jacob Warren, who's been there a while. Not a big number guy, but knows where to be and what to do. Uh, they've got some younger guys coming in uh, in their recruiting class who, who may help them. I mean, it's not a – I don't know that it's a receiving core where you look at it and say, this guy's a, a surefire first-team All-SEC guy, but the way it's played out, will somebody jump up from that bunch and become that? It's – certainly within the realm of possibility the way that it's played out. But here's the other thing we didn't really get into on the offense, guys, I wanted to bring up. As I said, Tennessee ran the ball more than it threw it last year, and it ran it really efficiently. Uh, our rushing stats that we do, we take out sacks because those are pass plays. Tennessee ran it a year ago, five and a half yards a carry. Uh, they had a three-headed duo outside of, of the rushing they got from the quarterback position, which was uh, very good as we know. 
But they bring back Jabari Small, Jalen Wright, uh, their first two backs a year ago. Dylan Sampson in flashes looked maybe like he was the best of the bunch. Those three dudes are back. Uh, they got a lot of guys coming back to block for them. We talked about Campbell, the left tackle transfer from Miami. Um, we've got Cooper Mays coming back to start again at center. They got Spragans coming back to start at right guard. Uh, and at right tackle, a couple of guys in Mincy and Davis who played a good bit a year ago. Um, I don't think people talk a lot about Tennessee's rushing attack, uh, but that's something I think that people have slept on that needs to be talked about here. T- Tennessee has to. Josh Josh Heupel, that is what his offense is predicated on. He they they have to get the uh, the run going to be able to make it work. If they can't run the football at a decent clip, a la the Georgia game last year, that offense is not what it what it can be. It doesn't reach its full potential within that game. They have to be able to run the football with with Jalen Wright and Jabari Small and Dylan Sampson, as you put it uh, pointed out, three of the more talented backs in the SEC. I think. That is one position group, if you're going to point to one, that say Tennessee could possibly have the best position group of any in the SEC. It, they, I mean, by the time all is said and done, running back may be, may be that position group because they're very, very good there. But uh, that – no, no doubt, Blake, you you would be fooling yourself if you don't think that Josh Heupel and company, just because they spread it out, that they're not a physical running football team. Yeah, I mean they've got options for sure, and like you said, I think that's just that's why they're so hard to to stop. Is that they just you know they have a variety of ways that they can approach how they want to beat a team, and and I think we we've seen that, and and this season, like we talked about earlier, who knows if if there's inconsistency at quarterback? Yes, they'll have to lean on this a lot more in terms of their run game, but they already kind of proved last year that that they could do that. So yeah, I would say that the one guy I would just keep an eye on is sort of just maybe the breakout guy. I know Chris was talking about that. Beyond the obvious, I mean, I don't know, some people it may be obvious, but I think Ramel Keaton is probably the, the one I would say could. I'm not going to say he's going to become Jalen Hyatt and you know have some of the ridiculous stat lines he had, but I do think Keaton's probably the guy I would look at and see him as sort of that breakout star probably uh, in this offense. Again, assuming everything else goes according to plan. So, and Squirrel White can fly too. So yeah. he's a and Brew, Brew McCoy is more of a tough. He's not going to. He's not a burner, but he's more of a move the chains great tackles, uh, you know, tough uh, receiver for Tennessee. All right, parting thoughts on the Vols here, guys. I'll, I'll let you guys each give one, whether it's a, an overarching thought you have on this team, whether it's maybe something we didn't get to in the preview or, or whatever. Blake, I'll let you go first, and Blaine, then I'll wrap up with two that I've got. No, I think it's – um. Yeah, as we said, the expectations are to keep winning and to keep challenging Georgia at the top, to be the team that can challenge Georgia for the SEC East title. And Tennessee wants to be able to claim that every single season as long as Georgia is there, right? And that comes down to this season again, right? You get your opportunity in Knoxville uh, later on in the season, and who knows where both teams are at that point. But, um, yeah, so I think it's just – starts with the quarterback position to me and the the development on defense. If those two things can be answered very early on, if we're like, hey, look how good Joe Milton is. Look how improved this defense is just in terms of, um, you know, the consistency overall and the different things they can do um, schematically just to kind of get better in certain areas. Then, yes, that they will. I would be surprised if they're not the team that is right there with a chance to, um, you know, be right behind Georgia or perhaps challenge Georgia for the SEC's title. How do you handle success? Because it's been so long that that when Tennessee was where they were, they wanted to be. And last year they got really, really close to that. And there's a lot of excitement in Knoxville. You had students and, and faculty and, and fans and everybody praising you and telling you how, how good you were doing. Um, So how does the, how does this program handle the success i'm talking about the players i'm talking about the staff making adjustments because when you have success people move on to other opportunities you said alex golish so that's a thing there's turnover there's turnover in personnel there's turnover in the staff so how do they handle those adjustments and can those guys who are with a lot of talent coming back around them can the newer guys and the guys who didn't play the entire season last year, but maybe played some, can they step into those feature spots and not skip a beat? 
Yeah, here's my parting thoughts. And, and Blaine, I'm going to build off something that you mentioned as we started the video. They've kind of gone from the hunter to the hunted. You just touched on it again. How do you do playing with expectations? How does Joe Milton do playing with expectations and with the, the quarterback dynamic that you mentioned? I think that's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, the, the thought that I've heard, and I'm not I'm not endorsing this or, or denying it, I'm just telling you I've, I've heard this, so that they feel like, this is going to be the, the weakest team maybe they they'll have for the foreseeable future. I guess they're recruiting at a higher level. Now, sometimes better recruits don't make for better players. Uh, they make for other things. I, I don't know that I buy that. I think I've been bigger on Tennessee for a lot of reasons we outlined. A, a lot of dudes, a lot of bodies, a lot of experience. I, I'm not as ready to to put them in that you know maybe 12 to 15 in the country range that you're seeing them picked at as some others are, but that seems to be the sentiment. And again, we live or two of the two of us live in the national area. So we hear a lot of a lot about the Vols. But uh the the prevailing thought seems to be that this is a good team with the better teams to come. But I'm I'm not sure that I'm ready to uh to go there yet. But we'll see. That'll be interesting. The other thing we don't talk about special teams. Uh and Tennessee didn't punt a lot a year ago. In fact I, I couldn't tell you their punter was last year because we saw him so infrequently. But Tennessee's got new specialists at kicker and punter. Uh, Jackson Ross, an Australian rules guy that I'm reading the, the notes in Lindy's, said he struggled in the spring game. And they bring in Charles Campbell, a kick, kicker from Indiana. He was 14-20 to 20 on field goals a year ago. Now, Tennessee didn't play a lot of games where field goals were, were big deals a year ago. lopsided games. But that just might be something to keep your eye on in case the Vols are in one of those field goal battles with an Alabama or Georgia or somebody like that, uh, you could see that come into play. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how that goes. All right, we are going to preview every single SEC team this year in depth. We're going to do a lot more stuff. We've done schedule previews of every team, so you can catch those on our channel. We're going to go through the schedules and make predictions before the season. So, We'll do those in a different video. we got news as it comes. We'll be at least Blake and I at SEC Media Day, so we'll have covered wall-to-wall -wall there. Just cannot wait till the football season starts. We're doing this in mid-June, and uh, my goodness, we've got a lot of football to cover between now and then and a lot more to cover when it starts. Best way to catch it, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. That helps us out with our analytics. For Blake Lovell and Blaine Gilmer, I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.